Welcome to another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. What would you do if your child had Dravet syndrome, an extremely rare drug-resistant epilepsy, and experienced hundreds of seizures daily, and the only thing that helps her is cannabis, but it's illegal where you live? Would you leave the country to help your child? That's the dilemma facing Vera Toomey of Ireland, who joins us today. Vera, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much indeed. Now, your little girl, Ava, is just over seven and a half years old. When was she diagnosed with this rare form of epilepsy? Well, um, when Ava was uh, four months old, we we took her for um, to, for her, one of her vaccinations. And we went into McCroom to our local town. I'm from a small village called Ahabulloch in mid Cork here in Ireland. And we took her into McCroom to be vaccinated and... She was vaccinated at 11 o'clock and she had her first 45 minute seizure that night at sometime after 8 o'clock. Um, we were rushed into the, the CUH, into the hospital in Cork City by ambulance. And regrettably, um, Ava's seizures haven't really subsided since or I, I should say they didn't subside substantially until the introduction of CBDI last October. We went through about 11 different forms of anti-epilepsy medic- or anti-epileptic medication and all of the medications failed Ava. She was experiencing constant seizures, daily seizures, tonic-clonic seizures daily, alongside absences, myoclonic jerks. Um, uh, it, it was, it, it's been, it's been a very, very difficult journey. She she would some days have had, you know, up to up to like 20 or 25 tonic clonic seizures. And alongside that, she would have dozens and dozens and, you know, hundreds of absences. And, you know, it's it's been it's been a very, very it's been a very, very trying few years for Ava. Did you think that she would survive, Vera? Um. I did I think that she would survive well Ava's a not just not just that she's my little girl but Ava's an extraordinary little person when we were diagnosed with Dravet syndrome in the weeks following Ava's first seizure the neurologist brought us into a room and she told us that Ava would never walk she would never speak she would be wheelchair bound and that we needed to accept that Ava would be in residential care for the rest of her life if she lived beyond the age of three. That that is the delivery that we got when we were diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. She also gave us a couple of photocopied pages which were entitled Dravet syndrome for dummies. Um, And that's what we were given. that's what we were given when our our first child was, you know, less than six months old, and I I would I I remember being in the room that day, and you know I wouldn't usually swear or anything like that, but I used a lot of profanity, and I just kept saying no, 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 and our daughter has defied everything that they have said about her. Ava did get up and walk. Now, she was well over two years of age when she did get up and walk. And regrettably, again, the seizures were ongoing. And she was introduced to a drug called steripental, which has proven to be incredibly successful for a lot of children across the UK and Europe, I believe, as well. But unfortunately, Ava did not have um, <clears throat> a good result, excuse me, on steripental. And she ended up in a coma for a week after she was introduced to the levels of uh, steripental. And we, we, we really begged the neurology team in the CUH to stop increasing the steripental because it wasn't working. But they continued to insist that all we needed to do was to keep increasing it and eventually the seizures would stop. When we were finished with the steripental, our daughter had been in a coma for a week. She came out of the coma, 
I can remember being in the high dependency part of the ward. There was five or six doctors inside in the in the room and five or six nurses. Nobody had told us that our daughter was in a coma. It was only that afterwards I demanded to get access to our daughter's notes that, uh, you know, it was it was written on the notes that that's what that's what she was in. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, we did nearly lose her at that time, but she got up again. She woke up. She I remember she pulled the she pulled the cord, you know, the the you know for the for the drip what you call that again i can't think intravenous yes she, yes that's right she pulled the intravenous drip out of her arm and the next thing she was she was awake but she lost all her body mass you know she lost the ability to walk after that and it took Ava another year to get back up on her feet to gain weight again and to get back on her feet and going was she um, able to speak at that time we had some words we had we had some words at that time now unfortunately she was introduced to a drug called topamax as well and afterwards we found that one of the side effects of topamax is that it affects your speech or your developing speech so she had lost some words when she'd been on the topamax but had gathered some more words but we lost you know, what progress we had made with Ava after that experience. After the coma. Um, after the coma, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, we continued on and, and, you know, we were, you know, we were staggering from one medication to the next and always being told this one now, the next one now that we try, you know, this is a very good medication, this is a strong medication, this is well documented to succeed but in every case for our daughter they failed um it was october of 20 um october of 2015 we were told that there was no further medications to assist our daughter and paul my husband and i we said to the doctors that what 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 are you going to do then what 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 do we what do we do next and they told us to take her home and make her comfortable so essentially the the medical team were telling us to take our daughter home to die how Um, old was she at this point vera that was october 2015 so she was six years old at that stage she's actually just turned seven last november so she's 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 seven and a half now um that was the the time that um, I began the change.org petition for Ava to try and gain access to medicinal cannabis here in Ireland for our daughter. I had done an awful lot of research into the medicinal cannabis over the previous years, particularly our, our attention was was caught by Charlotte Figgy's story um, because she had the Drave syndrome as well. You know, we just thought if this little girl can have such success on cannabis oil with the same condition as our daughter, you know, it would be hope for for our child as well. So like over the course of the we, we began the petition and incidentally in November of uh, 20 Yes, that was twenty the November of 2015, Ava had 17 seizures, tonic-clonic seizures in eight hours, and she suffered a cardiac arrest inside in the hospital. They um, overdosed Ava and lorazepam, and uh, she had a heart attack. Oh. So, um, you know, it, it, it was, you know, that was our life. You know, every every winter between the months of, you know, October and say February, we would spend probably three months or more inside in hospital. We were on a a, a first name basis with the paramedics teams coming from McCroom, from Cork, from Killarney, from all the different places that the ambulances would become from. We knew them all. They all knew us. They, as rural as we are in Ahabulloch, they all knew where Ava Barry lived. It was ongoing. 
we we tried to contact the government. We tried to get in touch with um, Leo Varadkar. Um, initially, was Minister for Health when we began our petition, um, and subsequently Simon Harris was uh, the Minister for Health. Um, we tried to arrange a meeting with Simon Harris to um, put our case forward, and it took. Um, five, six, seven, eight months for me to get a meeting with Simon Harris. When we met him, they said that they would do everything that they could to assist us, and we were very hopeful. They said we needed to get a paediatric neurologist to prescribe medicinal cannabis for our daughter. Now, I didn't know at that stage that that was really an impossibility in Ireland because the, the consultant neurologists in Ireland at present are unwilling to prescribe medicinal cannabis and the legal situation that surrounds THC is also very problematic. So I could not find a paediatric neurologist to prescribe the medicinal cannabis for Ava. Um, in November of 2016, after I had commenced to walk from my home here in Ahabulug, I walked um, 23 miles in that day from Ahabulug to Mallow. And Simon Harris rang me that evening and he said that he would meet me again. He said that he was not comfortable with me walking. And uh, I said to Simon, well, do you know, Simon, I'm not fierce comfortable after walking 23 miles myself either, you know. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> And the we, walk was um, to, Vera, just interrupt, the walk was to gain attention to your It your was, plight. it was. Yeah. Exactly, Corey, because the, the, the communication in that at that stage in November of 2016, the communication had broken down. Um, at that stage, Gino Kenny uh, TD um, from uh, out from Clondalk and above in Dublin, he had tabled a bill um, for the legalisation of medicinal cannabis for the likes of our daughter Ava, and that was making some progress at that stage. But our situation was so urgent that we needed immediate attention for our daughter. So after we had that next meeting with Simon and he said to us that we could get a GP to um, apply for an exemption. So we found a GP to apply for the exemption. And by the time that that paperwork was done the following February, that was rejected. And they told us it was rejected on the basis that it wasn't a paediatric neurologist that had applied. So we said to them, you told us that a GP would be sufficient and they denied that they had done that. So we were back again at square one with no hope at all. Simon had asked me to promise him that I would not walk again. And I said to Simon, I'm not promising you anything. I said, I, I, will, I will postpone the walk based on the fact that we will get some help for our daughter. But if we do not get help for Ava, I will recommence the walk for Mallow where it finished the last time. So that was why in the, the end of, I think it was the end of February time, um, we began a walk again. Uh, I'm Vera, I, I, I began, uh, Brian O'Mahony, who was representing his son Killian, who has Lennox Gastro syndrome, um, and is also anxious to gain access with, along with his wife, uh, Sarah, for their son Killian. And Lindsay Graham, another lady um, who was walking with the hope of getting medicinal cannabis for their for her mother. And Gino Kenny T D, he he walked with us to Dublin. So it took us nine days to walk from Mallow up to um the Dáil in Dublin, which is like the Parliament here in Ireland. And along the way we met the most extraordinary people. There were there were actually thousands of people walked with us up that road uh, over the, that that nearly week and a half that we did that in the most torrential rain, snow, sleet, wind. It was it was the worst couple of days you could possibly have imagined being outside. And when we got to Dublin, 
I would say confidently there was over 3,000 people down from the gates of the Dáil covering the whole street back down to Trinity Corner. Um, and we again had a meeting with Simon Harris after arriving. Simon did not come out to greet us. There was a text message sent to my phone and on the text message they said that they would meet meet us in one of the the minister's offices um, at something like, I, I, I don't know, I think it was uh, five o'clock or something like that. Um, we had a four and a half hour meeting and the outcome of that meeting was, there was a number of things. They told us to approach our public neurologist again, to approach our private neurologist to consider the Compassionate Access Program, which Simon Harris and his, uh, his uh, HSE department had set up, to uh, look into the Treatment Abroad Scheme. And finally, there was some discussion on the legislation. Now, we approached the public neurologist and the public neurologist said that she could not oversee Ava's care because she didn't have enough clinical evidence to support Ava's treatment and she did not have enough expertise within the country to refer to. The private neurologist was extraordinarily helpful. She is a wonderful person and she got in touch with um, a neurologist in Toronto Children's Hospital, actually, um, a lady, an, an Irish lady who is, uh, is, is working there. And she, will, she suggested that we would travel over to Canada to get treatment for Ava. But unfortunately, Ava is not stable enough to make such a long journey. So again, the private neurologist came back and she said, OK, we'll, we'll try and figure this out. So it was suggested that there would be a teleconference consultation done between Cork and Canada. Um, then the, between the, the private hospital and the HSE, they decided that the one neurologist would not be enough to oversee Ava's care. In fact, it would be necessary to have two neurologists. So we were not able to provide two neurologists to assist Eva. So that opportunity was cut short as well. Now, the Compassionate Access Program has been set up as a reaction to the legislation and to the, the profile of uh, medicinal cannabis being raised in this country as we speak. And it's a very narrow and in my, my opinion, now it's just my humble opinion, but I feel that the Compassionate Access Programme in Ireland is a platform for pharmaceutical-based CBD medication. It is only available via this Compassionate Access Programme in the form of Sativax for multiple sclerosis and the spasms associated with multiple sclerosis. It's available for Epidiolex in terms of intractable epilepsy. And there is another medication, which I'm so sorry that I cannot recall it, but it is for the nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. And um, they're the only three conditions that are being included in the Compassionate Access Programme. There is no regard whatsoever being given to sufferers of chronic pain. You know, there is a wonderful pharmacologist in Galway University who has dedicated over 17 years of his life in the study of cannabinoids. Um, his name is Dr. David Finn. And regret regrettably, chronic pain was not included in spite of the fact of the significant research that's been done in Galway University. Um, it wasn't included in the Compassionate Access Programme. Vera, we when, have um, Vera. I just, yeah. I, I just want to ask you: When uh, you gave CBD to Ava, how did she respond? Um, when we began the Charlotte's Web in October, Ava had eleven consecutive seizure-free days. That was the beginning of our experience with CBD Charlotte's Web, and. I can tell you that my husband and I were, we, we weren't even broaching the subject for the first couple of days because we just could not believe our own eyes. We, we were sort of both saying in our own heads, 
is this really working? Like, is this really happening? There are no seizures. The seizures are gone. There is, there, there was, there was no myoclonic jerks. There was no absences. There was no tonic-clonic seizures. And for 11 consecutive days, she had no seizures. Now, she's very, very prone to ear infections and so forth because I guess the pharmaceutical medications had um, <clears throat> a significant impact on her immune system. So she got uh, she got uh, an ear infection, and we got another we got another couple of seizures. But I think what we had was we had five seizures in October, we had nine in November, and we had seven in December. And I can tell you that that decrease in seizures is up to ninety percent because Eva was Eva was having probably over five hundred seizures every month. More, in fact, you know, I wasn't strong enough myself to be able to write down consistently the seizures that Ava was having every day on the calendar like I'd been asked to because it was heartbreaking. You know, Mm -hmm. you'd be talking about 12 one day, you know, six the next day, 14 the next day, you know, and and so forth. There was just so many, so many you lost count. Yes, yes, yeah. Like yeah. there was, it, 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 it well, well up to five hundred, and certainly in the winter months beyond that, you know, it has altered her existence. It has just changed everything, and this is whole plant medicinal cannabis, like that we're talking about. The the epidiolex that is being offered via the compassionate access program, in my opinion based on the trial that was done over on Great Ormond Street, which the results of which showed that one child died on the trial and there was significant negative side effects like dizziness, nausea, um, weight loss, uh, personality change was another very, very frightening side effect that um, the neurologist uh, had to us about. But yet the neurologist still wanted us to put Ava on this medication. I would firmly and continuously say no to that because I feel like there is a better alternative out there than that type of risk. Children like ours that have to work so very hard for the progress that they make, they do not deserve to be put at risk with something that could be so detrimental and put back their progress so significantly. So I I would be wholeheartedly more in favour of a more natural product than what the GW pharmaceuticals are offering in the form of the Epidiolex. Vera, I'm wondering what Ava's development was like during this period when she was having minimal seizures. Um, Well, we have one really, I mean, it's a really emotional kind of a document. Um, when we, when the GP, as I said to you, put in the application for Ava's exemption for the medicinal cannabis, we asked the school where Ava, Ava attends to do a report based on how Ava's progress had been since October of last year when she began the CBD oil. That report was given to us in February and they told us in that report that Ava had made more progress in those months than she had done in the previous two years at the school. Wow, that speaks for itself, eh? We're very proud of her. What what are you going to do now since um, medical cannabis is illegal in Ireland? We are... We are... It's just quite extraordinary to be saying it because we have tried so hard. We have been so respectful. We have put forward as as good an argument, I think, as we could. You know, I thought that Ireland was a better place than this. You know, I, I really did. I I thought that... I thought that there was more humanity in Ireland than what has been exhibited to our daughter. And... Because of the fact that, you know, we have made, um, we have raised the profile, I think, or contributed to raising the profile of medicinal cannabis in Ireland. And many, many people have come forward with their stories that they are using medicinal cannabis to treat many other conditions aside from epilepsy. But for Ava, we are being forced to leave our country. And where are you going to go? We are going, I think it's looking like we are going to Holland. 
to look for treatment for our daughter in Holland because the HSE, the health, the health services executive in Ireland and the neurologists are demanding that we prove that Ava will improve on medicinal cannabis, including the THC and the CBD. They have not taken into account the masses of evidence that is out there. They have not taken into account the masses of research that has been done over in Canada regarding medicinal cannabis and the results that it has shown with so many people. They are demanding that we leave our country to prove to them that Ava will succeed on THC and CBD and then we will be asked to apply for a license to be allowed to return to our country. So until such time as we gain access to that license, we won't be able to return with Ava on her medication to this country. This is absolutely criminal. I just cannot believe what you've gone through and I can't believe you have to leave your country to save your daughter's life. Yeah, I mean, it's like... I, I contacted, um, I, I, I don't know if I told you this, but I, I contacted a clinic over in Spain called the Calapa Clinic. And I went specifically over to Barcelona, to the clinic over there, to see a doctor in the clinic to get a prescription for medicinal cannabis. And they felt that, you know, based on on Ava's the numerous amount of medications that had failed Ava and her success on CBD oil, that the next natural step was to go on the THC medication. They prescribed me the medication over in Spain. And I felt, now, I was criticised for declaring the medication at Dublin Airport, but I felt that I'm not a criminal. I'm Ava's mom, and... All I was doing was going and filling a prescription for my daughter based on the on professional people's opinion that it was um, the right thing to do. And when I came back into Dublin Airport, the passengers from the plane, including myself and uh, uh, Gino Kenny, TD and Luke Flanagan, MEP, member of the European Parliament, they came to Spain with me to support me in this. And we were put up against the wall and they had sniffer dogs at the airport that searched us. And ironically, the sniffer dog did not detect the THC oil, which I had, but I declared the THC and we were interrogated for over an hour at the airport and the THC medication was seized from me and I could not bring that medication back to Cork for my daughter after it was prescribed in Spain. Vera, what has this done for you in terms of your emotional stability yourself, you and your husband, in dealing with your daughter's constant seizures over the years until CBD rectified that? Well, I think that um, I'm a very, very fortunate woman to have the husband that I do have. Paul and I were friends for a very very long time before we kind of got romantically involved (laughs) um so we have a very very strong relationship and we support each other and i must say to you that like this has put an incredible amount of pressure on our relationship it has taken a lot of strength on both Paul's part and my own to kind of keep each other going. But the thing about it is we love our kids and no matter what pressure it puts on us, it is our children that is fundamentally our priority. We have four children. We have Ava seven, Sophia five, Michael is four and Elvira May is two. And they are our priority. So at the moment, Medically, you know, and physically, Ava needs us the most. So we have put every bit of strength that we have into trying to get this medication for Ava in our own country. And that is why we did the we did the things that we did. You know, we we're not we're not public people as such, but we were forced into this situation that we had to become very public about Ava's um, illness and Ava's needs. And, uh, you know, I think 
you know, I think Paul and I will do just fine. But uh, it, it is very, very difficult. It is, it is, it is very, very difficult. And I think that any parents that are out there that have children that have very specific needs, like our daughter does, they, you know, you you understand how hard it is, and you know how frustrated you can be, how angry you can be sometimes, how how you just think everything, every question that you ask, the answer is always no. But you know, we've we've stuck with it, and my my mom, Kathy, she she lives right right near us here, and she's been just the most magnificent support to me as well you know so um i don't think like it's i think like this man that i used to work with lango he he said you know you do what you've got to do but the thing is you couldn't do it without your family around you or really good friends because otherwise it'd just be it'd just be really impossible very have a an absolutely wonderful story. Ava has wonderful parents, and uh, I think we Thank will you. do we will do whatever we can to get your message out. Because when I heard you tell the story about meeting with politicians, quite frankly, I've worked with politicians most of my life, and what they were giving you was absolute bullshit. And Mm -hmm. when a a politician meets with you at 5 o'clock and meets for four hours, the reason they do that is because the 6 o'clock news comes on at 6, and they don't want you talking to the the media. And the newspaper deadline has is over by the time your meeting was over four hours later. And when he tells when he tells you when he tells you I'm sorry when he tells you not to do the walk anymore, the reason he's telling you it's not for your health. It's for his political mm. well-being because he realizes the pressure is on him. And I think it's reprehensible what politicians will do in order to advance their own careers at the expense of sick children who want a plant, who want the compounds within a plant that has never killed anyone. It's disgusting. When we had that long meeting with with Simon Harris that night, you know, I, I can additionally say to you that Simon told us in front of his parliamentary colleagues, in front of all of us, Simon told us that we would reconvene in three weeks to see what progress had been made on the points that we had discussed. And subsequent to that, he would not meet with me again. He 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 refused to meet with me again or correspond with me again after that meeting. And I think it's it, it was... It is deplorable what they have done. Um, as a as a protest to that, we we camped out outside the doll for the night. As a protest, um, we just wanted to talk to him. You know, I said I, I said to um, a representative from Sinn Féin that came out to me. You know, I said, look, you know, if he would just meet me for fifteen minutes with for a cup of tea, that I would speak to him just about what is happening. He would not meet me. We sat down outside the gates of the doll and blocked the gates. And I promise you, I am not a I'm not a confrontational kind of person or anything like that. But these are the ends that we were driven to. This is how desperate we were. Um, that is what people in Ireland are being driven to at the moment, you know, because they will not they will not help us, you know. What I would ask the people that are listening to, listening to this program, you know, we we need this medication in Ireland, and you know, I think that we actually need the help of people from other countries out there that have this medication. We we need it here in Ireland so badly because I don't want to leave my home, you know, I don't want to take these children away from this beautiful environment that they live in out here in the middle of the country, you know, to a different place away from their away from their nana, like we're going to have to do. And I would ask people to send an email to simon.harris at oir.ie. That is his email address. And say, why? Why is this happening? Why is this not being allowed? This, this is, it's, it's, it's a human right to have access to a proper form of medication. And that is all we are looking for. We have exhausted 
all avenues in terms of pharmaceutical medications for our daughter. And there are thousands of people, thousands of people all around Ireland, people that came and walked on the road with us, thousands of people that need this. But our government resists. Our government is frustrating the legislation that Gino Kenny has brought forward. At the health committee meeting that was held regarding the um, the, the legislation, a pharmacist at, placed on that health committee d- said that it would be immoral to introduce, it would be immoral and utter madness to introduce medicinal cannabis into this country. And they refused to hear the evidence of an eminent professor over in England, Professor Michael Barnes, who produced the Barnes report. And they refused to hear evidence from Gareth McGovern, GP, and from Cahal O'Sullivan, GP, who had tabled a motion for the Irish Medical Organisation in Ireland regarding medicinal cannabis. And that, it, that, that meeting of GPs, that motion was passed. And all of this evidence could have been given on the health committee, but it was refused and they would not hear these people's evidence. So I would I would ask, you know what, I would ask like all the Irish people that are out in Canada. I'm sorry, no, I would ask you for your help because we we want to be able to come home to this country because in spite of what they've done to us, this is our home. You know, and we we need it so badly here. And I would just ask you to to please put it out there to people that we need help. We need it really, really badly. And okay. if you could email Simon, it would be it, it, it'd be it'd be a great thing to know. We have a petition, the change.org petition, Ava Barry. There's a picture of Ava. She's got a little red dress and pigtails on the on the change.org page. Please sign it. You know, maybe it would do some good to to, to read. There's about 44,000 signatures on that petition at the moment, but it looks like we need a lot more. Vera, can you repeat uh, Simon's email address? It is Simon Harris. It's spelled S I M O N. Dot Harris H A R R I S at O I R dot I E. Vera, it was wonderful to talk to you, and we wish you all the best in the months and years ahead. And we'll do what we can to help you out. Thank you so much. I I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's real real privilege to speak to you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Vera, for sharing. And we wish Vera and her family and the thousands of people in Ireland all the best in their efforts to get medical cannabis legalized in that country. Wherever you are in the world, thanks very much for listening. You've been listening to the Cannabis Health Radio podcast. Visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. 